I really appreciate that you were able to take the time to attend this very important lecture by a very important scholar who has been a mainstay of literary and cultural studies for a long time. Uh, he was, among other things, the, the president of the National Humanities Center from 2003 and 15, and taught at the University of Pennsylvania, Tulane, and Duke. He has written 13 books and over 100 scholarly essays and articles. His most recent books include Scholarship and Freedom, published by Harvard University Press in 2020, and Citizenship and Catfish Row, Race and Nation in American Popular Entertainment, University of South Carolina, Carolina, Carolina Press 2022. So without further ado, please help me welcome Jeffrey to the podium. Thanks, Professor Majid. And it's good to see all of you, especially President Herbert. Uh, people have been very solicitous to me already. I come from the South, and they are afraid that I can't handle the cold. But I grew up in Chicago, and there's nothing here that frightens me uh, in, in the least. When I asked uh, Lucille a couple weeks ago, you know, the, the lecture is being given on Monday of Thanksgiving week. Is anybody going to attend? She assured me that the students were absolutely required to attend. So <laughs> yes, they were going to be here. Still, thanks for coming. I want to frame this talk tonight with, with two large questions. The first is deeply personal and perhaps something that, that is rarely considered by most people under ordinary circumstances. Uh, and the second is very general and it's something that we consider all the time. But they are quite related, as you'll see. The first one I want to frame with this quotation from Alice Munro from a story called Friend of My Youth. The narrator has just had a disagreement with her mother on the subject of sex, and then this passage unfurls. The mother, she says, knew that you could die of it. So she honored the decency, the prudery, the frigidity that might protect you. And I grew up in horror of that very protection, the dainty tyranny that seemed to me to extend to all areas of life, to enforce tea parties and white gloves and all sorts of tinkling inanities. The odd thing is that my mother's ideas were in line with some progressive notions of her times, and mine echoed the notions that were favored in my time. This in spite of the fact that we both believed ourselves independent and lived in backwaters that did not register such changes. It's as if, and if you can commit this sentence to memory, you'll be a better person for it. It's as if tendencies that seem most deeply rooted in our minds, most private and singular, have come in as spores on the prevailing wind, looking for any likely place to land, any welcome. Uh, the genius of Monroe, and genius it is, she never uses fancy language. There's nothing particularly flashy or flamboyant. But when she got the Nobel Prize, every writer in the world said, oh, yeah absolutely deserved, even though she only writes short stories. But here, what I'd point to is the, the, the particular, the, the, the telling insight, which is that we have all the time, maybe every day, about others, that they, that they just conform as they follow the conventions of their time and place. That insight is almost never applied to ourselves. Individuals, for the most part, are just passive participants in a general cultural mood that our most private and singular thoughts are in fact the thoughts of the group, and in that sense are not real thoughts at all. It's so easy to see this kind of conformism in others, but it is incredibly difficult to see it in ourselves because it insults our dignity. It insults our autonomy. It, it insults even our, our very identity as individuals. Who am I? What am I if I'm just a relay station, a kind of switch point in a network of connections, transmitting something that I got somewhere to somebody else who will do the same? We want to think of ourselves as free-thinking individuals, but the only evidence for that is some point of dissent, some kind of opting out of the general view. And so the first question I want to pose have you ever experienced a clean moral break on a serious issue 
with the consensus around you. I mean a serious issue, not a slight difference of emphasis or a little refinement in the way of posing it or maybe a different bit of evidence for supporting it. An absolute rejection of the consensus on moral grounds. It's important that the issue be moral and not just logical or factual because moral grounds involve issues of values and principles and these are chosen. So the question is, have you ever been a moral hero? This kind of heroism is rare for two reasons, I think. First, the rewards for going along with the consensus are so manifest, they're so immediate. Everybody loves you and you love everybody. And second, some clean breaks with the general consensus are just nuts. And people who are heroes in their own eyes might be taken as nuts by the community. They might pay the price. So before you become a moral hero, you have to ask yourself whether everything considered, you are absolutely certain of your position. And if you are, whether it's really worth to others and to you, including your family, to stand up in isolation, implicitly accusing all those around you of hypocrisy, bad faith, weakness, or wickedness. So to repeat, do you have any thoughts on important issues involving values and principles whose true origin lies within yourself and not in some such spore, as Monroe so brilliantly puts it? And if you answer yes, yes I do, well, how confident are you that your answer could stand up under close scrutiny, with your noble values being perhaps exposed as just self-interest in a different key, or your originality just conformity to a different model? Really? What thoughts might those be? It's a disturbingly difficult question to answer. Versions of it arise all the time on college campuses like this one, where in a highly filtered and self-selecting group of people, both students and professors, these days in particular, seem to be hypervigilant about signs of offensive or discordant, that is, non-consensual sentiments, and where partly through the miracle of social media, punishments for deviation can be swift, drastic, and sometimes irreversible. So strong are the prevailing winds, and so infectious are those spores of opinion that are born on them, that it sometimes feels as if the people who remain uninfected by them are treated as if they are the sick ones. This kind of vigilance is not unknown or unprecedented. The Puritans, who may actually have believed that you could die from sex, faced it in England and practiced it in New England imposing forms of punishment even for tiny deviations that they had learned from their persecutors. How decisively have we put those times behind us? We may and often do say that we are a rights-based society and that individual choices and judgments are precious. The value we place on the private individual is what differentiates us from other societies in which the group is the final arbiter, as well as judge, jury, and sometimes executioner. But how highly, really, do we value a genuinely individual judgment? So that's the first question. Have you ever been a moral hero standing apart from the consensus of the group? Now the second question, which, as I said, is one that we pose all the time, is less troublesome. Is there any position that one can take on an issue of importance that is so far beyond the pale, so utterly wicked or reprobate, that there can and should be no forgiveness for it, no return to polite society, a position for which the consequence is and ought to be permanent social death, a position that marks you in a way that you carry around with you forever like a stigma or a tattoo or perhaps like a scarlet letter. <laughs> I actually have a candidate in mind. It's remote from our country, and it occurred in the past. And this means that nobody here needs to feel a personal stake in the discussion, 
and we can consider the question in a more disinterested spirit. How about support by a fully conscious, intelligent, educated, prosperous adult for the apartheid regime in South Africa? For those of you who are too young to remember, the concept of apartheid or apartness was the fundamental principle behind the policies of the National Party, which ruled South Africa for much of the second half of the 20th century. This policy affected virtually everything in social and economic life, effectively quarantining the black population, which constitutes then and now about 80% of the population. Whites are called Afrikaners, descendants of the Dutch uh, uh, settlers, 10%. Colored, another 10%, dominantly Indian, and then 80% is African. Apartheid, as I said, severely curtailed and restricted the rights and opportunities uh, of those people. The National Party was the party of the uh, Afrikaners who ruled from 1948 till 1990. Their regime ended when Nelson Mandela, who had been a freedom fighter, who was imprisoned for 27 years, often in solitary confinement. You can go to Cape Town today and go to Robben Island and see the cell where he was kept. Uh, there was very little room in it uh, uh, as punishment for his anti-government activities. <clears throat> he was released from prison in 1990. And somehow, by some miracle I do not understand, he was not psychologically devastated. He was not a kind of uh, personal cripple. Um, he came out with a smile on his face, and a few years later, he was elected president of the country. He was fully conversant with the issues and fully capable of assuming the responsibilities of the presidency. Uh, shortly after that, he won the Nobel Peace Prize, along with the apartheid prime minister who freed him. From the time of his imprisonment to his death in 2013, Mandela has been an absolutely inspirational figure for people all over the world, and apartheid has been absolute anathema, a watchword for racist wickedness of an almost incomprehensibly direct, thorough, and brutal kind. Now, I suspect that many of you are thinking that there would and should be no hope for the reputation of anyone who defended or participated in the policy of apartheid, especially one whose support was considered fully conscious and public. But just for the sake of argument, let's take a look at one such. His name is Bernard Ladakhan. He comes from an apartheid family in an apartheid city, Stellenbosch, it's uh, west of uh, 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 Cape Town, in an apartheid nation. He was baptized in a mass ceremony in the hills that celebrated the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Afrikaner movement, which is the, the self-assertion of the Dutch against the British, who owned most of the uh, power and, 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 and uh, resources of the, uh, of, of the Cape. Here is Stellenbosch. You can see it's beautiful, it's wine country, and his Ceremony was up in the mountains there. It must have been quite dramatic. His home was the center of the, not his home, but the, the, his hometown was the very center of the Afrikaner movement, and thus the very center of the apartheid philosophy. In fact, the Ladakan family lived, lived quite near the first grant of land given to a Dutch settler in 1673, a site of land which is almost a sacred site to Afrikaners. It's the first plot of land that a Dutch settler actually could claim to be own, owner of. As a teenager, there he is, Mr. Ladigan became a founding member of a secret group that supported the Afrikaner political movement, a youth group that served as a kind of recruiting arm for another secret organization. It was called the Broderbond. And I'm going to get into a little bit of details here, uh, not only with uh, uh, South African history, but also with theology and biblical hermeneutics, I will never stray from issues that affect us directly. So if you can just bear with me a little bit, I'll make it as easy as possible so you don't have to become too deeply interested in uh, uh, hermeneutical theory in order to, to track along. I'm just giving you a, some sense of uh, Lodigan's biography. <clears throat> when he was old enough in the late 1950s, he joined that secret organization, the Broderband, the Brotherhood itself. 
He was universally accounted a very gifted, promising young man. He went to the university, Stellenbosch University, the same university that every apartheid prime minister from 1903 to 1948 had attended, right next to that first grant of land ever given to a Dutch settler. At every point, in every way, he was the very heart of the apartheid ideological and state apparatus. From where we now stand, this morass of colonialism and racism sounds like pure evil. It's almost incomprehensible in an intelligent young man. How did this happen? How should we think about it? Should we condemn him for all time? Can he ever be reclaimed and permitted to re-enter, or rather to enter for the first time, the community of the righteous? If you're like me, you incline to the first option and think that he had passed well beyond the point of no return. But hard judgments should be able to stand up to any test, so let's test this hypothesis by looking a bit deeper. And in testing them, we will, I think, be testing our own judgments. I'm going to read a passage in a book that I've been reading on the plane up. It's, it's from a book called Rules by Lorraine Daston, an historian of science. She's written a history of rules. <laughs> you can imagine undertaking such a, such a project. I can't, and I'm happy that she did. Here she says, one of the uses of history, especially history pursued on a longer time scale, is to unsettle present certainties and thereby enlarge our sense of the thinkable. It's a curious property of the reigning conceptual milieu to appear coherent and inevitable to its inhabitants in much the way that local customs seem self-evident to provincials who never leave home. The mental world we happen to inhabit contracts the imagination to its own cramped dimensions. One epoch's self-evidence, how could anyone think otherwise, is another's perplexity. What were they thinking? <laughs> and if you've passed, say, beyond the age of 23, I think you have a good sense of what she's talking about. Uh, you know, you get a little bit older and things that had seemed compellingly obvious, so literal, so manifestly true that there could be no issue of opinion on this come to seem kind of strange, distorted, like what was I thinking? You know, what was I thinking? And the certainty that anything that you are thinking right now will in due time, and maybe that won't be much time, come to seem mysterious and incomprehensible should provide us uh, with a little bit of humility in judging others. So that's the premise for what I'm about to say now. <clears throat> Begin with the fact, it's shocking to me when I first heard of it, that the system of apartheid that Mr. Latikan was supporting, having grown out of the struggle for Afrikaner independence from the British, that was the Dutch had a rebellion against the British, thought of itself in very different terms from other forms of racism or xenophobia with which it has been allied. Afrikaners thought, if you can believe this, and I'm asking you to, they thought of themselves as having a freedom agenda. For us now, and for everyone else later, but a freedom agenda. <laughs> Equally shocking to me was the further discovery that for the Afrikaners, freedom was not just a political principle. It was God-given to a much greater extent than it is in our country, where there's some nod to God and the Declaration of Independence, but it's a very secular movement, really. Uh, in South Africa, the apartheid agenda was a theological agenda. It was a theological agenda. They thought of themselves not just as an ethnic or linguistic group, but as a providential community with biblical warrant. Afrikaner theologians, Afrikaner people generally, saw themselves depicted in the Bible with a compelling directness, discovering in the story of the liberation of the Jews from Egyptian bondage, a heroic account of their own struggles of liberation, their own faith, their own mission, their own community. And more than that, the Afrikaner community also saw itself reflected and anticipated in the communities of believers that gathered around Christ. In this context, the discipline of theology acquired, as you can see, I think, political significance. Mr. Lodigan, a patriotic young man, committed both to his nation and to the service of God, determined to become a biblical scholar in the service of the state, in the service of his people. After his BA at Stellenbosch, he goes to the Netherlands to get a PhD in divinity, 
and he writes on one particularly luminous text. It's a long text, St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. He read this in the approved way as an account of the necessity of the community of the faithful, understood implicitly as his own community, to stand together, united. The central question in this text is the question of cultural survival. Paul was telling the Galatians that Jews could emancipate themselves from Roman law by converting to Christianity and becoming a community in Christ, a community called unto liberty, just as the Afrikaners themselves had risen up against the British in the name of liberty. The word of God was their own myth, but it was not just myth, because sophisticated biblical scholarship using philosophy, linguistics, history, textual analysis, hermeneutical theory, had established a sound scholarly basis for understanding its message. The more sophisticated, the better, because modern scholarship would provide modern backing for traditional beliefs and make it kind of impregnable to assault from scientific skepticism. This way of thinking was entirely mainstream, as was the sense of a very sharp delineation among racial groups. In fact, the Bible had an explanation for that as well. To objections that the Genesis account actually argued for the unity of mankind, after all, we all came from Adam and Eve, Afrikaner biblical scholars replied that the diversity of the physical world, with Adam naming the beasts individually, was the model. Mingling of any kind represented a backsliding. As one scholar put it, the prevailing view in the Dutch Reformed Church held that the mother of all questions is the question of race relations, and that the mother of all books, the Bible, speaks with authority on issues of Babel. In other words, apartheid was not only the law of the land, it was the restoration of the diversity present at the creation, a diversity God himself had created or recreated after the fiasco at Babel. In other words, apartheid pursued, you might say, a diversity agenda insisting on the diversity. To each his own. The phrases used in the South African context were sphere sovereignty and separate development. Separation meant that the whites could look after their own interests, confident, confident that God smiled on their endeavors. As one scholar said in 1947, whites could be good Christians and at the same time watch over the survival of their race with holy gravity. It is and has for a long time been tempting for a secular citizen of a European or North American country to regard all this as a kind of witch's brew peculiar to South Africa, a separate development, we might say, unique to the singularly depraved society of a colonial racist state. I grew up thinking this way. I thought this way for many, many years. Far from the enlightened nations of the West but claiming some distant kindred with them, set on a course of self-preservation in which strange and evil ways were miscast as divine revelation, devoted to racial self-interest in a way that the advanced societies of the West had long since repudiated, cruelly insensitive to the facts of oppression that were self-evident to anybody who were not under the spell of the mass delusion that had seized the Afrikaner people, the South African nation, everybody thought, had walled itself off in its own criminalized sphere. Although it must be said that with respect to the citation of biblical support for government authority, the Dutch Reformed Church was not entirely different from some rhetoric in other countries, including our own. I'm thinking of June 14, 2018, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions defended the Trump administration's policy of separating families of asylum seekers at the border and rebuked protesters by referring to Romans 13, 1, 2. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. For many in the West, though, it was easy and even appealing to think of apartheid as a kind of moral zero point. And anyone, Professor Lodigan, for example, who participated in the apartheid regime as a moral criminal. So we start from that point. I've been speaking about the plan that the young Lodigan was pursuing by entering the study of divinity. It was, he thought, a, a, a solid and respectable plan 
But early on, he began to have problems. He went to get his PhD, as I mentioned, in the Netherlands. And he was disturbed to find that the ideas that were taken for granted back home and universally accepted were met with universal rejection <laughs> and disapproval. He found himself being questioned, challenged, provoked. Three years of this, and he returned, not entirely dissuaded from his initial ambition to support the country and the government by sophisticated theology, but he was troubled. And then in his first job, he goes to the University of the Western Cape, which is a colored university with an all-white faculty, it should be pointed out. He encountered other surprises. He went there because the church assigned him to that position, and he was a theologian, uh, and he was an operative within the church. He thought he would be received very skeptically because of his, what he would call his conservative background, but instead he found that he was greeted with openness and respect as a member of the university faculty and the faith community, and this actually surprised him. He didn't think he really deserved it. Over time, daily experiences of generosity or fellowship picked away at his deeply held belief that the differences between groups were ineradicable and irreconcilable and made him more responsive to a different view. And as part of his ministerial mission, he began to get around. This is so interesting. He was visiting local Bible study groups, all led by women, where he encountered an altogether different, to say the very least, way of reading the word of God from the kind of reading that he and his colleagues at the Divinity School were promoting. This was a period of what we might call social unrest. If you've ever been in social unrest, you know how inadequate that phrase is to the, to the fact. An uprising in Soweto, which is the massive, it's called a township, but I've been there. It's not, it doesn't conform to our idea of the, uh, of the word township. There's well over a million people there. They're uncountable because people come in and go all the time. And homes are not, they're not structured the way homes are. Um, I'll interrupt this just to say, I've been to Soweto. It it's, remains the most troubling of uh, my touristic experiences. I was with a, a guide, and I said, I want to see not just Nelson Mandela's home, which is a place of festivity where there's shops and music and people with parades and things, but I want to see where the actual people live. And he took me, and he said, when you cross this, this railroad, you're crossing into a different world. And it's a world where a stiff wind would have blown down any, do any domicile that was there, and often did. Uh, there was very little electricity. There was very little running water. <laughs> and we were walking down the streets. Uh, it's, it's not a comfortable experience uh, by any stretch. You, you cannot feel that you're altogether operating in good faith if you're just looking at people who live like this. And a man met, motioned to my guide that he wanted to wanted us to come into his home. So my guide said, well, if we have to, offering his hospitality, we have to do this. So we go in, and uh, uh, the, the ceiling is just over my head. The walls are corrugated tin. There's nothing in there that you could call furniture, and there's no illumination. Uh, and of course, he spoke no English, so my guide was speaking to him in Kosa, probably. Then the man said to my guide, he would like to introduce you to his sons. I said, OK, you can hardly refuse that invitation. And the man gestured to a hole, it seemed. Uh, and one after another, six tall young men <laughs> came out of the hole until we were all standing here uh, looking eyeball to eyeball. And you know, this is Soweto. This is, a, this is, is a, 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 a site of permanent danger. You know, if social unrest is going to happen anywhere, there is always more than enough reason for it to happen in a place like this, as friendly, indeed, as deeply hospitable as he was. Uh, uh, any real contemplation of his actual situation would lead him, and perhaps especially his sons, to conclude that the world was not operating fairly on their behalf. Anyhow, in 1976, there was such an uprising in Soweto, social unrest. It was put down with a violence that absolutely shocked the world. Some 700 people, according to some estimates, were shot in the streets. The initial provocation, by the way, was the introduction of the Afrikaner, Afrikaans language as the language of instruction uh, in Soweto. Of course, Afrikaans is native only to the, to the descendants of the Dutch settlers, not to the Africans, and they didn't like that. Measures of restriction and control increased in severity 
all across South Africa. And some, at first a small member, began to entertain doubts about the entire apartheid system, which had sounded so noble in conception, but had become, in the eyes of the world and in their own eyes, a program of suppression and rule rather than a program of independence for us now and for you later. Ladigan was among those who were deeply disturbed by the state of affairs, but as he had always done, he attended to his professional discipline, keeping abreast of new developments in scholarship. This to me as a scholar is an entirely fascinating episode. Unlike many in the divinity school, he found feminism, which was just then emerging, very interesting. He also attended to new theories of interpretation that stressed the potential, the phrase was reading against the grain and searching for hidden subtexts in apparently clear and straightforward messages. He read with particular interest about new developments in hermeneutical theory, which is the theory of interpretation, particularly in the work of this man, Paul Ricoeur, a Frenchman who insisted on the role of the reader in creating meaning. I remember the impact of Ricoeur's work. Uh, it was radical if you believed it because the text, which had been considered the site of meaning, was refigured as a, a site, rather, of exchange. And the reader was given the responsibility for creating the meaning, him or herself, rather than just discovering the meaning that was already in the text. In Ricoeur's work, the reader is not just the passive recipient of the text, but really a, a kind of co-creator. He was read uh, eagerly in English and philosophy departments, and he speaks the language of theory but Lottigan, a young theologian, saw that that theory was being put into action in the women's study groups that he was attending. These groups, he noticed, were extracting from the Bible messages of love and conciliation, reconciliation, and healing. They were very different from the harsher, colder messages that he and his learned colleagues had been developing with full scholarly armature in a spirit of what he came to understand was, was profound moral originality. They were thinking in terms of direct access to the spirit rather than mediated access through learned pedantry. With this theoretical orientation in mind, Lodekin began to look back into his text, his one text which he, which he kept with him for the entire 30 or 40 year period that I'm talking about, St. Paul's letter to the Galatians thinking about it from the Galatians' point of view, not from St. Paul's point of view, but from the Galatians' point of view, the reader. And he noticed a passage that he'd not previously paid much attention to, a phrase about how in the community of the faithful, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. Previously, he thought this referred to the invisible community of Christ that, that gathered in some kind of abstract spiritual sense. But he saw now that if you took it literally, it was a vision of an inclusive community rather than a community of religious, of, of rigidly defined groups with a tight little band of faithful setting against everyone else. He began to rethink his scholarly approach. Has he been doing it right? Great stakes hung on this question. Might Recur be correct in defining the text not as a passive object oriented towards the author, but as an exchange oriented towards the reader? If there's anybody here, and I know there's at least one, who recalls the heady time of the early 1980s, you'll probably remember that the basic message of theory was that the text was unmasterable, it was completely enigmatic, a seething field of possibilities that could never be stabilized. You could never speak about the meaning of the text as if there was one. Advanced theories at the time, and they were all advanced. To be a theorist was to be advanced. Seemed to take considerable pleasure in the thought that, that the text, so reassuringly inert in its physical embodiment, was in fact a chaotic and ungovernable field of possibilities. To such theorists, the entire field of biblical hermeneutics which tried to discover the will of God in what they saw as a mere play of signifiers was utterly misguided, that is to say, altogether unadvanced. But the fancy theorists of the 1980s were not living in a volatile and increasingly dangerous culture 
with riots and bodies in the streets and fresh condemnations of them being published and broadcast in the world's press every single day. In such a context, radical indeterminacy did not have the same carefree carnival implications that it did in the seminar room. Living in such an environment, Professor Ladigan was beginning to see things in a different way and was coming around to the suspicion that the text did not defeat all attempts to read it, as the theorists were saying, but rather that it welcomed all such attempts. Different readings were not to be discredited, much less policed. They were to be recognized, celebrated, and respected. I want to underscore the depth, and even I would say the profundity, of the difference between traditional understandings and the new understanding that Lodigan was beginning to ponder. Considered as the word of God, the Bible represents authority itself, and that's how it was read, as an absolutely authoritative voice speaking in favor of absolute authority, God's. But considered as a text under the new theories coming out of Europe and North America, the Bible had to be considered as a refusal of authority, a license to reader to draw such sustenance from it as they could. What, what a richly and imaginatively reading of the theory movement of the 70s and 80s, and what a remarkably abrupt and decisive inversion, or rather conversion, of the conventional order of things. In the midst of what he was beginning to understand was his own conversion Lodigan noticed that the incident for which St. Paul is chiefly famous is his, quote, conversion on the road to Damascus, when he was struck by a vision of the risen Jesus and demanded to know why Paul, who, who was a vehement anti-Christian, was giving him such a hard time. And Paul instantly converted, becoming one of the apostles, became, entered on the way to becoming St. Paul, urging everybody else to convert as well. Lodigan noted further that Paul was not a scholar not yet a saint when he wrote his letter. He was an uncredentialed person speaking to others. So the women's study group he was going to were actually more in Paul's spirit than professional seminars led by theologians such as himself. And finally, Lodigan noticed how Paul was writing to people that he did not know. His original readers were required to use their wits to figure out his meaning. So how could anyone today insist on a single correct reading? In short, Lodigan was beginning to understand that the biblical text bore, or could bear, a very different message from the one that he and his colleagues had been pushing. Religious people who relied on biblical guidance, which is to say the entire society, had to take this new approach very seriously because they, like he, were committed to modern scholarship as the best guide to the Bible's true meaning. A change in the scholarly approach to interpretation was entailing a change in the meaning of the Bible, and therefore a change in the self-understanding of the nation, and therefore a change. And so, amid the turbulence of the early 1980s, Lodigan approached the heretofore inconceivable point where he felt he had to express personal reservations about the whole business. The message he was beginning to formulate was that he, a loyal Afrikaner who had believed as they had believed, was now compelled by new evidence and against his initial inclinations to change his opinions. At first, his deliverances concerned only biblical interpretation, their larger implications heavily coded and legible only to scholars. But in a 1984 article with the almost aggressively pedantic title, Current Issues in the Hermeneutical Debate, <laughs> uh, he came close to a political statement writing, Resistance to ruling conventions of interpretation is in fact a reaction against what is perceived as the ruling class. Believe it or not, this article, Current Issues in the Hermeneutical Debate, became, as one person put it, one of the most widely read and intensely discussed articles of the decade because it clarified the stakes of debates about Bible reading and more astonishingly, it did not renounce or denounce resistance to ruling conventions or to the ruling class. 
as his hermeneutical principles were loosening up, his political views were hardening, and his list of political offenses grew. Here's a, an abbreviated chronology. The first in 1984, a reaction against what is perceived as the ruling class. Uh, uh, he also said in this article <clears throat> that the text is actually the text and its readings, which is very much like Paul Ricoeur would have said. And he concludes that St. Paul's letter with conversion as the central message actually supports the overthrow of an existing oppressive order. 1987, the option for inclusive democracy in which he contended that a non-racial, inclusive, and pluralistic democracy was more in line with Christian norms than the apartheid system. This is not just an opinion. I mean, if opinions like this get loose, a whole society, remember, 10% of these people are Afrikaner, 80% are African. Uh, and so the, the stakes are quite immediate and horrifying to many people. 1987, he directly opposed the National Party in elections, and this did not happen. The National Party was uncontested for 40 years before that. His wife, Esther, ran for parliament on an anti-apartheid agenda, narrowly loses, but decisively lost all of their friends. 1989, publishes a call for social action based on a new understanding of society that would emerge from creative and imaginative theological thinking. And when he refused to unsign this statement, he lost his position at the university, was sent back to the colored university. He had made his break. So he lost his friends, lost his job, become a dangerous man to know, a social and professional outcast. But then January 1990, Nelson Mandela was released and the world turned. A couple of years later, Mandela's president of the nation. The Afrikaner population emerged from its long nightmare, blinking in the sunlight, and came to grips with a new reality. Somehow, largely through the moral heroism and sheer physical bravery of Mandela itself, which Morgan Freeman portrays very persuasively in a movie that I urge you to see, along with Desmond Tutu and others, power was transferred and mass slaughter was avoided. Somehow, I don't know how that happened. Nobody really knows how that happened, except that Mandela's charisma was so great uh, and his influence over his people so uh, unquestionable that he refused to let it happen. There's a famous speech that he made when uh, the danger signs were growing. People were arming, and there were voices saying, we should just kill all the white people. It wouldn't take long. And Mandela said, take your guns and throw them into the ocean. This sentence, public, widely publicized at the time, is still repeated with great reverence and gratitude by uh, Afrikaners in South Africa today, and throw them into the ocean. Lodigan's friends returned, some assuring him that they had secretly agreed with him all along. Like others who had resisted, a few others, he was now reevaluated as a man of courage and vision rather than as an outcast and a pariah. So, what next? He then uses his newly acquired prestige, not simply to resume his distinguished career as a celebrated scholar, but to lecture all over South Africa and indeed all over. Most of his energy went to the creation of the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study, which seems a very distant and um, remote uh, a place for him to put his energies. I'll explain that in a moment. This institute has taken its place after 20 years in a small but elite group of such institutes as Princeton, at Princeton, Stanford, Radcliffe, the institution where I work, the National Humanities Center, Sweden, the Netherlands, Israel, France, and Germany. There's only about nine of them. In 2017, a new director was put in place, Edward Kiramira of the University of Makerere. The Wallenberg Foundation in Sweden has committed to ongoing funding, and the Swedish Academy has just sponsored a, a series of lectures associated with the Nobel Prize. That is Lodigan on the left, that is Edward Kiramira to his uh, right, or to the right of him, and then the others are the president of the university and the president of the board of trustees. This institute is located near Lodigan's childhood home, it is located, in fact, on the first grant of land ever given to an Afrikaner settler in 1673. This land has now been repurposed, becoming transformed from the original site of Afrikaner presence in South Africa to an African site intended for international exchange. Now, 
You can decide for yourselves whether Professor Ladigan has earned the right to take a position among the community of the moral. But to conclude this story, I'd like to draw attention to the role of scholarship in this transformation. This has been a very scholarly talk, and his career has been very scholarly, although it had immediately uh, 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 and directly political implications. As I said, Ladigan's new understanding of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians focused on Paul's experience of conversion. I believe that Ladigan may have been predisposed to this new understanding because he was a scholar. Scholars are not exactly renowned for their willingness to change their minds, but I believe, in fact, that conversion is the hidden dynamic and the core message of scholarship itself. Let me explain. Here is a statement by Renaissance scholar Stephen Greenblatt, looking particularly uh, swarthy here, describing a book that he had written. Look at the way he describes it. I began with an initial hypothesis in which Shakespeare's plays were precipitated out of a sublime confrontation between a total artist and a totalizing society. The result of this confrontation between total artist and totalizing society was a set of unique and exhaustible and supremely powerful works of art. That's the first part. The second part, he says, something happened. In the book, something of this original conception survives, but it's been complicated by several turns in my thinking that I had not foreseen. I can summarize those turns by remarking that I came to have doubts about two things, total artist and totalizing society. In its starkest formulation, this message could be expressed as, formerly, I believed X, but now having confronted the evidence, I'm compelled to believe Y, or, my previous convictions were the result of desire or preference. My current beliefs are simply the truth. Getting to the point where you can tell this self-humbling narrative about yourself is actually, I believe, and it's not that I want to believe this, I don't want to believe it, but I'm compelled to, to, to say this because it's the truth. It's the entire point of the whole business of scholarship. All of it, the vast tedium of scholarly labors with the footnotes, the bibliography, the archives, reading all those tiresome and self-important authorities. The endless search for the truth in a maze of possibilities is undertaken just so the scholar can depict himself as a once proud but now humbled person. But for that reason, a person who must be believed because he has no possible personal reasons for saying what he says. A convert's zeal can be detected in the dullest scholarly tone. Until now, X, has been misunderstood, but I have the truth. The fundamental message of scholarship is not static at all. It's dynamic. Things are different than they seem. So to return to Mr. Ladigan, I would venture to say that his commitment to scholarship predisposed him to other kinds of conversion, including the one that resulted in his break from apartheid or orthodoxy. Getting a PhD, he was, in a sense, already on the road to Damascus. And this leads to a more general point about clean moral breaks in general. Such dramatic events do not generally happen as the result of a blinding vision of the risen Jesus or a blinding anything. More often, they take an incremental form in which, through a chain of entailments, prior commitments or decisions in areas that might seem altogether innocent uncontroversial or unrelated, exert an increasing pressure on one's beliefs or conduct, pressure that may not have been anticipated and may for a long time go almost unnoticed until it is not, until it is somehow irreversible. And yet, to others and perhaps even to oneself, the break may seem radical, unaccountable, irrational, and destructive of all that is or was good and true. In many cases, that's actually the truth. This chain of entailments takes the form of if-then propositions, where one says to oneself, for example, that if one is committed to the idea of God and to the Bible as the word of God, one must pay the closest kind of attention to the text in which that word is expressed. And since God gave us reason, this means that one must apply the most advanced methods of scholarship to biblical interpretation which means that one must respect the discoveries about interpretation that are being made in the most prestigious centers of learning, which means 
that one must pay attention to the often unstressed moments as well as to the most obviously important and to the productive role of the reader, which means that all the readings of the Bible have a certain claim of legitimacy, which means that those women in the villages or townships who are studying the Bible in a spirit of reconciliation and consolation must be accorded the same respect as the most learned theologian who is deriving messages about pluriform creation and good neighborliness and separate spheres of development, which means that those women might have status comparable to them, and so on and so on. And now, one might conclude at the end of this chain of entailments, now that these two readings are suddenly side by side and are presented as equally plausible alternatives, I can see that they both suggest a certain worldview that is in some ways equivalent, but contrary. I can compare them and ask myself which is preferable. In other words, I can ask what sort of world I would truly choose to live in, a world in which there is neither Jew nor Greek, free nor slave, or a world in which hard distinctions between peoples are said to be ordained by God and enforced by the police and the army, an understanding that is earning the world's condemnation. I can ask where my conscience truly lies, and if I decide that a world without slavery dedicated to freedom is closer to my convictions, then the, que then the question becomes, what am I going to do about it? What do I have to do about it to make the world a better place and even to maintain my self-respect? There will be costs for any decision that I make. Which costs can I bear and which would I find unbearable? How do I want to live? What's the meaning of life? Who am I? And I'll leave you with that.